Okay, everybody, it's time to pray and it's time to strap on our seatbelts because we're going to talk about um, cosmic war, what's really behind everything, what's behind uh, our temptations, all of our spiritual battles, uh, the, some of the unbelievable discouragement or desires that come over us, how that happens, and how all that fits uh, with Isaiah and the fall of Satan. But let's pray. Dear Father, I pray you'd open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. And I pray that you would sanctify us by your truth, because your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Isaiah is God's call to us to live the perfect peace, shalom, shalom life. We live it in a crumbling world, but we live it in the midst of a war. And many believers don't even think about the fact they're in a war. The Bible says that we are more in a war than servicemen serving in overseas deployments. Now, I know here in Korea, uh, you have to do mandatory uh, service because North Korea has, what, 20,000 artillery pieces pointed at Seoul, I think was the last figure I read. And they are ready to launch nonstop artillery shells against Seoul. And so it's a constant threat, I guess. Did you know more important than that, than physical war, is this cosmic war? So what we're looking at, and if you think about how Isaiah is laid out, first we have to accept the fact that what we're even studying is trustworthy. Our culture has abandoned God. The only way we can impact them is by consecrating or surrendering or dedicating ourselves. The, the one that wants to lead us is the Messiah, and he's the one that's going to fulfill all of God's promises uh, in our lives by his spirit. God has a plan, and the plan is to pour out his judgment on earth for all who reject him. Now let's look at the, the programming. Did you know when you run your computer or your cell phone, what is making this hardware work is the software. You and I, when we got saved, God downloaded a new operating system to us. Now, for uh, Apple, we're on iOS, I don't know what. You know, they, they just updated it again. The same for the computer. But that software controls what you see on the screen. Now, think about it. What you see going on around you is controlled by the spiritual world that we're often not aware of. So Isaiah 14, and open your Bibles to Isaiah 14, God, for some reason, right in the middle of all this that we've been studying, throws in a chapter that explains something. Explains how Lucifer rebelled, how he became Satan, how he took a third of all the angels with him, we call them demons, who are now the real aliens. Did you know there's a fixation on aliens uh, in our culture? I mean, UFOs, aliens, alien structures, uh, whatever. And what all of that is talking about is this, the cosmic war. What's the cosmic war? It's the battle between God and Satan. And there are only two power sources in the universe. Either God is empowering it, or Satan is empowering it. Now, Satan is a created being, and he can only empower what God allows him to empower. But when someone talks about a, a, some kind of supernatural power they have, you should listen. I mean, I've heard about it. Uh, when I grew up in school, there was a person and they would do this for us. They could take a spoon, you know, a metal spoon, like a teaspoon. They could hold it, and they would concentrate and look at it, and the spoon would go like this. Mm. They, they kind of melted the spoon. That's a common thing. It's called a metaphysical power. Where, where do people get these powers. Well, if it's not coming from God, and God isn't a big spoon bender, you know what I mean? That he doesn't spend his time doing silly things like that. 
where does it come from? Where do people that, that say they can tell the future, where do they get that from? If it's not from God in the Bible, where is it from? See, that's what we're talking about. That's what the cosmic war is. So the first question we have is, where did Satan come from? Right here, we're gonna look at Isaiah 14 today. The corollary to this is Ezekiel 28. They both tell the same story. Only they're like the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Each one of the four gospels looks at Christ from a different angle. And so, you know, Matthew's looking this way, but John sees things that Matthew doesn't because he's on this side and Matthew's on this side. Mark is here. He sees things that Matthew and John see. Luke is over there. He sees things that Matthew and John and Mark, you know, it's, it's, that's why we talk about the four gospels give one complete picture. Well, God gave us two pictures of Satan. And above all the vast reaches of the cosmos, above all the galaxies, all the shining stars, all the circling planets, there are some very special creatures. And God made them, the book of Hebrews tells us, they are called ministering spirits. They're angels. Angels don't have bodies. Angels actually are intelligences. They're very smart. They're, they're around since creation. Angels know every language of the world. I, I can't speak any Taiwanese, not even one word. Angels know Taiwanese better than a Taiwanese knows it. They also know every other language in the world. They know all languages. Angels do not have bodies and nothing physical stops them. So screen, glass, metal, wood, concrete, they just come and go. They're everywhere. There are literally the minimum number of angels are, the Bible describes them as myriads of myriads. Daniel says there are 10,000 times 10,000, which is hundreds of millions. But those are only the ones that are around the throne of God. There are a lot more than that. So let's say that there are a billion angels. All of them are involved in, in this whole process and they all somewhere sort out either with Satan or with God. So, the bottom line of chapter 14 is Lucifer's pride led to this rebellion. Uh, first, the text, okay? And just to show you that Isaiah is talking about the Lord having mercy on Jacob. He will choose Israel. He's going through all this. And then he starts changing gears and he talks about the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow. Then all of a sudden Babylon comes up, okay? And then it talks about Babylon is ruled the nations, persecuted, all this stuff. Talks about Lebanon. And then look, it changes in verse 11 and talks about your pomp has brought you down to Sheol, the sound of your stringed instruments, your maggot, that's the things that flies lay, those little worms, cover you. And now all of a sudden, look at verse 12. Now we hear about the greatest creature God ever created, the most powerful creature, the most brilliant creature of everything that God made, the highest power and intelligence was this Lucifer, the son of the morning. And it says, you are cut down, verse 12, you who weaken the nations. Now look what verse 13 says. This is what Satan thought. He didn't say it out loud. What you have said in your heart. Now pause for a second. Did you know God's keeping track of that with all of us? Many Christians have two parts. The smiling part, they show us and what they're really thinking in here. What they're, look at, you said in your heart, verse 13. God knew Satan's motivations. Now it says in, in Paul's epistle to Corinthians that we will not know other people's motivations until the judgment seat of Christ. Remember I told you last hour how we're all gonna have our moment to stand in front? Did you know God is not only gonna show what we did, he's gonna show why we did it. That's why, do you remember what I wrote right up last hour was right here in that box, same color, green, pleasing God, that's the motivation 
that makes what we do last forever. We only have two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing myself. That's life. And God says, I want you in your heart to say the right things. Well, what did Satan say? Five things. This is the essence of his rebellion. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What is stars of God? Remember, there's a, a term that you learn in theology class. I don't know if you've had it yet. It's called analogia scriptura. Basically, what that means is that the Bible explains the Bible. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. That's, that's why the more you read the Bible, the more you study the Bible, the more connected together the Bible is. And so when I see this, I will exalt my throne above the stars, I immediately think about what it says in the book of Job when it says that the angels sang as they watched God create. And that they, in Revelation, those same angels that sang that Satan took a third of the stars and threw them to earth. And, and so basically find that the Bible talks about angels as sometimes as stars, as God's uh, messengers, as his angeloi. So basically, Satan says, I'm going to go up to the headquarters, heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne above all the other angels, the stars of God. I will sit in the Mount of, of Congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now look at this. This to me is one of the greatest evidences of inspiration. I will be greater than the Most High. Is that what your Bible says? What does it say? Did Satan say he wanted to be greater than God? Yes or no? No. What did he say? Equal with God. Now, chew on that for a minute. Think about that. If I was writing the Bible, if a man was writing the Bible, if Herodotus or Shakespeare were writing the Bible, this is the arch enemy of God. This is the ultimate rebellion. This is the ultimate enemy. What enemy would say, I'm just going to get equal with you. We don't think that way. What do we think? Take over. Be greater. That's one of the greatest evidences that this is inspired. This is really what Satan thought. Why? Because Satan knew nothing can be greater than God. God is uncreated. God is God. <laughs> Satan is a creature. God made him. And God made everything else. And Satan knows that. That's why you can learn an awful lot from when you guys study the Gospels. One of the ways you study Christ is to look at what Jesus said, what Jesus did. And here's the third part to really understand Christology. What others said about him. When, an, when a demon talks about Jesus, what did they say? They, they knew who he was. They actually said that. We know who you are. Do you remember what the one in Capernaum said? You're the, and he quotes Isaiah, the Holy One of God. So Satan knows who the Father is, and he knows who the Son is. And he says, I'm just going to be like the Most High God. So God says in verse 15, you'll be brought down to Sheol. And there it is. And I'm going to show you a chart of this a little bit later uh, when we get to Hezekiah. To the pit. Remember, I, I had drawn right here the earth, and there's this demon prison and the place where everyone uh, that's ever lived is kept, all the lost, to the lowest parts of the pit. By the way, no one's in hell right now, right? You know that. No one is in hell. The first person that goes in hell is the Antichrist and the false prophet. You understand that? Nobody's there yet. Where are they then? Remember the rich man in Lazarus? He's crying out in the flames and saying, have mercy and give me a drop of water. Where was he? He's in here. It's called Hades. It's called the grave. It's called the pit. 
It's called Sheol. It has many biblical terms. But that's, and by the way, we know Satan goes there because that's in Revelation 20. He's chained and locked in that pit during the millennium. Okay, and on and on it goes. So let, let's talk about it. Only God can explain Satan's or, origin and nature. Nobody else can. When I took our class around the British Museum, we walked through the Egypt wing. Do you know what's in the Egypt wing? It's called the Sixth Book of Moses. It's all the Egyptian witchcraft stuff. How they did curses and how they did charms and how they... Do you remember the Egyptian magicians could do charms and their snake would turn to a stick and their stick would turn to a snake? They, they replicated all of Moses' signs, but his overpowered him. Remember, his snake ate theirs up, and they could keep doing it until finally the chief, musician, or the chief magician looked at Pharaoh and said, Moses has the finger of God. We can't do that. You see, only God explains Satan's origin, his power, his limits, and what we're supposed to do with this uh, chief enemy. Just for a minute, look at Ezekiel, because I told you that uh, it's parallel. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, chapter 28 and verse 12. Because it follows the same uh, story, only it's talking about a different king. Now look at this. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, behind the proud king of Tyre. Wait a minute, what was Isaiah 14 about? The proud king of Babylon. Is that a mistake? No. Behind all proud people, proud kings, proud everybody, is Lucifer. Because Lucifer is the ultimate sinner. What's the greatest sin? Murder. Yeah, homosexuality, abortion, uh, you know, lying. Mm -mm. What's the ultimate worst sin? Pride. And what does every human being, what are we all infected with? That's why it, it, one sin can send anyone to hell. Some people are really good. They're really Good people, they only have one problem. They're proud. What is pride? Thinking I can do it myself. That's how we were born. We were born. Uh, we want the biggest peace for ourselves, the best for ourselves. We want the attention for ourselves. And there are two kinds of pride. There's overt and kind of the other side. Some people are like this. Oh, don't look at me. Don't talk about me. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. No, no. I don't want anybody to look at me. That's a form of pride. It's we want attention, either Big attention or control attention or whatever. So behind the proud king of Tyre and the proud king of Babylon and every other proud person is Satan. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord. Now all of a sudden, do you remember we, we talked about Isaiah and the other prophets are standing here and they're looking at events and their parts they don't see, but they're just talking about the highlights. Ezekiel was talking about the king of Tyre. Where's Tyre? It's where Hezbollah is. It's on the coast of Lebanon. It's a city. It's an amazing place. <laughs> the king of it, look at this. Verse 12, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty. Now, all of a sudden, this description of the king of the Phoenicians the Phoenicians were the first maritime trading group. They had colonies all over the Mediterranean. Almost everything you've ever heard of all the cities of the Roman Empire and of, of the Mediterranean are Phoenician outposts. Jonah was going to go on a Phoenician boat and sail to Tarshish. They were the ultimate maritime people. And they were very wealthy. And they had everything. And, and, and so it morphs from going to the king of Tyre to verse 13. Look what it says. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, you know what that tells me? If you were asking questions right now, you know what you'd ask me? When did Satan fall? Did he fall before Genesis 1 and 2? No. What does this say? 
He was in Eden. He was perfect in beauty, full of wisdom, covered with all these precious stones, nine are listed. And he was, in verse 13, what does Satan have involvement with? What does it say? Timbrels and pipes. Music. Isn't that interesting? It appears Satan was the worship leader of heaven. That's really what Satan probably, I mean, Lucifer was. Lucifer pointed everyone, all those angels, to pour out their worship to God before he fell. You were, verse 14, the anointed cherub who covers or guards. Uh, he reflected the glory back on God. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. How did Satan fall? What's the origin of sin and evil? That's the ultimate question of philosophy, of everything. Where did evil come from? And let me share a very simple explanation that the Bible gives right here. This is Satan. This is God. And God's holding him. It says in Colossians chapter 1 that God holds everything together. If it wasn't for God, everything would fall apart. Watch. Here's Satan, the greatest created being. Satan derives his existence from God. And all of a sudden, God went like this. He let go of him. When God doesn't hold you up, you fall. That's one of the simplest philosophical truths to start thinking about. Where did evil come from? Did God create evil? Well, in the sense of calamity, yeah, he's creating all the calamity of the tribulation. Did God create sin? No. God prevents sin, but when God stops, See, boom, Satan fell. We fall. Do you know what the greatest thing I want in life? I want God to hold me tight. That's why I said in the first hour, Jesus reveals the everlasting arms of the Father. He's the one that wants to hold us. That's why it says in Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. God keeps us from falling, Jude 1, 23 and 24. What happens when we don't want God's help? Boom, we fall. Lucifer fell. Why? Well, we see this other places in the scripture. Do you remember Hezekiah? We're going to see soon, uh, tomorrow. It said that God stepped back for a minute and didn't protect Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. And as soon as God stepped back, do you know what Hezekiah did? He opened all the doors of his palace to the Babylonians and said, look at all this gold that David piled up. Look at all this silver. Look at all these gems. Look at what we have collected. And he showed it all off. And it says his heart was full of what? Pride. God, at times, steps back and just leaves us on our own to see whether we, you know, my kids, they, they used to love to sit on my shoulders and I would have them like locked under my arms, both of their feet like this. And I would be pushing the stroller and they'd be riding up there. If I ever wanted to see if they were paying attention, I'd just go like this, you know, and loosen the, the and they jump and they, in fact, that's how I lost my hair. They used to hold my hair like it was the reins of the horse, you know, and, and, and one too many times I went like that and they pulled it and it all came out, but not really. Um, God wants us, he wants to see if we need him. And he allows troubles and trials and all kinds of things come into our life to see whether we go, I'll make it on my own and we fall, or whether we do, thankfully, what my kids did. When I would let go of them a little, they would grab me because they wanted me to hold them up. Lucifer didn't want God. He wanted to become like God. Uh, what does the rest of the Bible say about him? Revelation 12, 9. This is probably the most important verse about Satan. Revelation 12, 9. Do you know what it says? 
The dragon of Revelation 12 is the serpent of Genesis 3, who is the devil of Matthew 4, who is Satan of all the way through the Bible, the deceiver of the whole world. He's cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The tribulation is when God confines Satan to earth. He can't be out running around, going everywhere he wants to go. And all of his demons are confined to earth. Can you imagine how bad it's going to be when Satan has nothing else to do except bother everybody on earth? Do you know what he's doing right now? He's accusing us. The book of Job says, in, in Job 1 and 2, it says that Satan right now, his current job is, he is accusing the saints. That's what we find him doing in Job 1 and 2. He's going, God, don't you see what Job's doing? Job would curse you if you let me bother him. And God says, go bother him. He won't curse me. We find all the way through the Old Testament, Satan is accusing the saints. In fact, the worst thing God said to David after Bathsheba, do you remember what God said to David through Samuel? Samuel walked up to David who had just murdered Uriah and fathered a child with another man's wife. And Samuel looked at him and pointed at him and said, you have caused the enemies of the Lord to rejoice. Did you catch that? Satan came before the throne. He said, um, What's the man after your own heart doing right now? What's, what, what is he, he, did he just kill that guy? Is he committing adultery? Now he's lying. You see, Satan's favorite occupation is accusing us before God, pointing out all the time in our life that we don't need the Lord and we go on our own and we fall into sin. You see, Jude tells us, uh, Jude verses 24 and 25 say, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Did you know it's possible not to be sinless but to hold the Lord's hand and to not go into the things like David did that are so blatant. And by the way, while Satan's doing all this accusing, his angels are the demons that shoot fiery darts. Um, the war right now in Gaza is showing something. Every time the Israelis fire a missile at one of these schools or one of these hospitals, you see the initial, the missile goes boom. And then watch the video. About one second later, it goes boom. What did they just hit? Storage of weapons. They're targeting weapons depots. In fact, that's what the US is doing right now in Syria. It's awful to watch because people are involved. But the flaming arrow is the missile that goes in. It explodes. But the secondary explosion is what was stored there. That's how Satan works spiritually. You see, we allow temptations to build up in our lives. Thoughts, pictures, memories, words, lyrics of music. Uh, sometimes it's hurts that other people give us or unfulfilled desires, things that we think we deserve. And we pile those up and those are very flammable. And all Satan has to do is send one of his angels to shoot a fiery dart and it explodes that in our life. And we get either angry or we get totally fearful or we get totally depressed and paralyzed by that lust that's built up in our lives. Guess what's coming? First John 2, 18 and 4, 3 says that there is going to be an invasion from the pit in the last days. That's what Jesus said. He said, beware, deception, 
Uh, all these deceivers are coming. Satan is going to go in full, full overload. And during the final days, most people, Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, are going to be led away by false uh, teaching and evil spirits. So let's talk about what happened in Isaiah 14. I call this God's super angels, the most powerful creatures in the universe, and the only aliens that are out there in space. Here's how one cartoon drawer illustrates them. Uh, Lucifer, who we find in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, is the leader of the real aliens. And they're coming in Revelation 9. Uh, if you go to Revelation 9, you don't have to because I don't have time to go into it. But at the height of the tribulation, God in Revelation 9 opens that prison that's here on the earth and lets out these monsters that, well, this is what it said. The fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, pit, verse two of Revelation nine. He opened the bottomless pit, smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a furnace. The sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke. And then, and boy, if I was uh, a music writer for a movie, you can imagine kind of like Lord of the Rings music, boom, 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 out of the smoke come these monsters. And to them was given power like scorpions of the earth. They were commanded not to harm the grass or any green thing or any tree, but only people who are not sealed by God. Wow. And they don't kill them, they torment them. So that's chapter nine. Look at the next thing that happens in Revelation. Satan empowers the false prophet to make an image of the Antichrist and he brings that thing to life. It can talk and travel. Have you read Revelation 13 lately? Did you know Elon Musk is working on that right now? He's trying to implant chips in humans where computers, where you can actually have a computer in your mind so you would have all Google so you'd never have to study for your quiz. You would just know everything all the time. Can you imagine that? Only the fusing, the, they call it singularity, where humans and machine become one. Satan does that during the tribulation. Only Satan, think of artificial intelligence, which is all of human knowledge collected. Satan, demon power, with artificial intelligence, all human knowledge into a robot. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger tried to be the Terminator in his series. Can you imagine Satan's Terminator? Do you know what he does? He kills everybody that's a Christian on earth. He goes out and kills them all. It really is a horrible time uh, during the tribulation. Okay, where did, it, where did angels come from? Let me give you, if you're in theology, where you'd learn about all these things I've talked about, this is angelology. It's the doctrine of the creation of angels. God created all angels, okay? Two thirds of them obey and serve God. One third of them have gone in the rebellion with Satan. Some are in prison. Some of these angels are so deadly, so malignant, that God keeps them penned up. But most of them are loose right now. So that's for you to understand. Two thirds of all angels are ministering spirits. By the way, what do angels do for us? It says they are ministering spirits sent to take care of those who are heirs of salvation. Now there's one urban myth that's true. We do have guardian angels in the sense that there are angels that watch over all of us who are heirs of salvation. Hebrews 1.14 says that. Some angels are in prison. Those are the horrible demons. Most are not. What's an angel like? Each of the angels we read about in God's word has power that exceeds anything we can humanly understand by the laws of the physical world. So that's why when you hear about all these aliens, I mean, they always caricature them as these, these creatures. Demons do not have bodies. God explains the real aliens, which are the demons, the fallen angels that swirl around us. And basically, this is a summary. This is everything the Bible says about angels. As far as we know, angelic creatures are indestructible. You, you can't 
shoot them, cut them, you know, uh, ghostbusters, you can't spray them with something. They can't be killed, they can't be destroyed. They travel the universe effortlessly with no spaceships. You understand that? They seem to never need to rest or sleep or even eat. Isn't that interesting? Those are the real aliens. Um, there are two types, the good ones, angels, uh, the way we differentiate, we call the, the unfallen ones angels and the fallen ones we call demons. There are five orders that we know about. Now the Bible doesn't tell us this is all, but Lucifer was called the guardian. He was the highest. Just below him are the cherubim, the rest of them. Lucifer was a cherubim, only he was a different cherubim. By the way, what do cherubims look like? We read about them in Ezekiel. They have four faces and their whole body is covered with eyes. Every inch of them is covered with eyes and they have six wings and they have hoofs like a cow's hoofs. What a strange looking, but you know what they don't look like? Have you ever seen what the devil looks like? He's wearing red pajama tights with a pointy tail. He does not look like that. He looks like a cherubim, only he was the highest one. Then below the cherubim, we have seven that we know of, archangels. You know what they are? Jesus talked about them. He said, there is rejoicing in the presence of God. No, when one soul gets saved. Have you read that verse? No. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. Did you know that's who the angels of God are? They're the archangels, and they always stand facing God. There are seven of them. They're always facing God. And when one person gets saved, in their presence, who rejoices? God does. But what it reveals to us is these archangels, we know who two of them are. Who are the two we know? Gabriel and Michael. And those two are the only two that are named in the Bible. The Jewish uh, Encyclopedia Britannica names them all, but the Bible doesn't. Those archangels are the ones that always stand and face God. Revelation 1-7 talks about them. They're called flames. They're called uh, these, these flames that are around the throne. They're always standing there, and God goes, do this, do that, and they go off and do it. Then we have these. We saw them in chapter 6, the seraphim that seem to have something to do with the altar in heaven. And then we have all the rest of these, just normal angels. Uh, on the bad side, there's a lot more we know. The demon side, Satan became the angel of light. Satan's primary role is deception. So he appears to be a real angel. That's why every time one of these people have those out-of-body experiences, have you read about any of those where they die and they go to heaven? Do you know what they say? Oh, don't worry, everything will be all right. I just saw this gleaming angel of light and they told me, don't worry, everything is okay, everybody will be in heaven. One of them went to heaven and they said the first person they met was uh, Buddha and then they met Confucius, then they met Moses, and what they're saying is all religions are the same. That's what the angel of light says. That's what Paul said about Satan transforms himself into a deceiver. Then there's a destroyer. I'll tell you about him in just a minute. He will scare you to death. Then there are the horrible monsters that are let out in chapter 9 of Revelation. Then there are the ones Jude talks about and Peter. They're doomed. They're never let out of their chains. They're so bad. Uh, it says they're in everlasting chains under darkness awaiting the judgment of the last days. Then Daniel tells us about these, the nation princes. There's the prince of Greece. There's the prince of Persia. Then Paul in Ephesians 6 talks about principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Are those all different or is that one group? And then everywhere Jesus went in his ministry, there were those demons screaming. Let's just talk about one, okay? The destroyer. Think uh, for just a minute. Some of you just need to take a breath, wake back up and think for a second about this destroyer. This destroyer is talked about in Exodus 12, 2 Samuel 24. Paul mentions him in 1 Corinthians 10. 
He shows up as the leader of the monsters of the pit in Revelation 9-11. His name is the destroyer. In Hebrew, Abaddon. In Greek, Apollyon. Pause for a second. If you play video games enough, you'll run into those names. Those are favorite gaming names. Boy, if, if I knew anything about God, his word, and what he says about demons, I would never play a game that named the creatures in my cartoon gaming world after the most malicious, malignant, powerful, wicked creatures in the universe. That's one of the dangers nowadays. Gaming has taken over people's minds. It's, it's become a habit. It's become something, an addiction for some of them. Uh, I was speaking at Cedarville in chapel and took one of my kids with me and they stayed in the dorms. And they said, Dad, they said, the guys were up till 3 a.m. playing their gaming stuff and they couldn't wake up for classes. And I thought, their parents are paying 30000 or whatever to send them to Cedarville, and they're playing video games till 3 in the morning and can't go to their 8 o'clock class? Do you think they have time for this? Do you think this is very interesting if you are heavily involved in playing with Abaddon and Apollyon? Do you understand what I mean? It's, it's amazing how Satan is... is disarming Christians. Okay, let's talk about the destroyer. What, what did the destroyer do in Egypt on the night of the Passover? God took him, allowed him out of the pit, and God said, you can kill the firstborn of every male child in every home, and you can kill the firstborn of every animal in the stable, and back in the pit you go. Now remember, the angels know who's in charge. They always, they always are limited by God. So God let the destroyer out. The destroyer came to Egypt, surveyed Egypt, entered every home, knew who the oldest male child was, and killed him in their bed. Silently. Now think about U.S. Special Forces. We have the Seventh Fleet and the Sixth Fleet off of Israel's coast right now. We could do that. Think about it. Take a DNA you know, quick recovery group, set up shop, big tent, all kinds of electronic microscopes and swirlers, go take DNA samples from every person in a house, fly back the tissue, do a genetic study, find out genetically, because DNA does clicks, and you can tell who's the oldest person. They have the most clicks. That's how you can tell how many generations something has been. Find the oldest one, male, and eliminate them. That's terms that they use for special forces, eliminate. Do you know how long that would take? It would take hours to fly there, collect, sample, test, come back, re-identify, eliminate. This angel did millions of people, surveyed them, and in one night wiped out the firstborn. Plus, he was limited by the doorway. Here is the the doorway of every house. Here are the houses. Here's the door. And the Lord said, I want you to take blood and do the lintel and the doorposts. The lintel is this part. It's the framework. So you would put blood on the frame and then the doorposts. Most people, if you think about it, the easy way, if you're in a hurry, you take your blood brush and you'd go whap like that and then whap like this to get the lintel and the doorposts. You you wouldn't, you know, paint like this. You're scared to death that your kids are going to die in the the coming time. So you would as fast as possible get the blood, get the hyssop, get both doorposts and get the lintel and look what it makes. That motion would actually make a cross. And that destroyer came across. And every time he saw a blood-marked doorway, he skipped that house. Such a picture of salvation. Why? Because God is greater than the sum of all he created. All the angels, all the humans, all the universe. And only God can protect from the devil, the destroyer, demons, and hell. 
This is what Peter said. Younger people, by the way, that's you in this room, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Look at, look at how much humble and humility, how close it is to Satan and the devil. Do you understand Satan is drawn to pride, he's drawn to rebellion, and he feeds on that. So how do we get protected by God from the devil to destroy your demons in hell? Verse six, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Cast your care on him. Trust that he knows what's going on. Your adversary, the devil, is going around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. When you meet a Christian that's totally you know, in the ditch, they can't serve the Lord, they're afraid, they're angry, they're bitter, they're defeated, they're whatever, Satan just devoured another one. How do we get out of the ditch? Resist Satan, steadfast in the faith, clothe ourselves with humility. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter six, be strong in the Lord. That name, the strong tower, the righteous run into it and they are saved. The power of his might, not mine. Put on the armor of God. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Look, all these principalities and powers and all that are against us. What do we do? Take the whole armor. Withstand, stand, stand. Gird your waist with truth. Put on righteousness. Shod your feet with the gospel of peace. Take the shield of faith. Resist the fiery darts of the wicked one. Wear the helmet. And the only offensive tool, all the rest is defensive, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. My question to you is, are you protected for the daily battles? Are you wearing your Kevlar, your body armor? How do you wear body armor? Well, how did Jesus do it in Matthew 4? Satan came and attacked him, and what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It's important to have your intake. That's why every day with you, I do my devotional journal. I look in there for the word of God. I pick one part of that word of God for that day, and I prayerfully ask God to clothe me with Christ, with his armor, so that I can be protected from the daily battles. Why? Because tomorrow morning when you wake up, aliens are lurking around ready to attack. Demonic enemies more lethal than terrorists or murderers or hardened criminals are waiting for you. They have flaming arrows ready and they will watch for the exact moment to shoot that fiery missile into your mind. Are you ready to deflect the missile? Or will you have another horrible, defeated, empty, restless, discouraging, and sad day of defeat? That's the choice. That's the cosmic war. Satan's plan is to shoot his fiery darts. The attacks on humans are led by the serpent dragon named Satan, the devil. He, has a, he is a person and his singular focus is to be the adversary of God. The devil named Satan continually bombards God's children with flaming arrows of immorality, hatred, anger, covetousness, pride, doubt, fear, despair, distrust, and every other temptation. And every temptation, either directly or indirectly, tries to get us to doubt or distrust God. That's what Satan started with Eve. He said, did God really say that? Does God really know what's best for you? Remember when Satan was tempting Eve? And she listened to him and did not resist him. That's the cosmic war. And that's what Isaiah tells us we need to be prepared for.